Thank you all for, uh, for coming today. Uh, my name is Perry Krug. Uh, I am a senior solutions architect for Couchbase. I've uh, been working for Couchbase about two, almost two and a half years now, um, focusing all on the customer facing uh, implementation, deployments, pre sales, solution architect type activity. Um, so today I'd like to focus on uh, some of the considerations it takes to uh, really effectively run Couchbase in production. Um, so a typical uh, production environment, uh, we've seen this in various permutations before. Uh, you have a number of application users uh, accessing your application either through a web browser or a mobile device, um, hitting a load balancer that's fanning out to an application tier uh, that scales out very nicely, um, and then that's accessing uh, a Couchbase cluster underneath. Um, and we're, what we're going to focus on today um, is the interaction between these, uh, these two layers. Um, not so much from a development and how your application uses Couchbase, uh, but what workload and uh, production uh, environments look like. Um, and we're going to focus on this idea of an application life cycle, uh, where once you put something into production, that's not where it ends. Uh, you're constantly monitoring, you're constantly resizing, uh, you're constantly managing, um, and then you're looping back around and doing the whole thing over and over and over again. Um, and sometimes that's the cycle of months, sometimes that's a cycle of weeks, um, and really depends on your, on your application. But at each point in this life cycle, uh, every moment, every day of your application's life, uh, you need to be able to provide uh, that sort of reliability, performance, uptime, um, all of those characteristics that make a, uh, a production environment and application function. Um, so before we get into uh, each one of these uh, points along the line, I uh, just want to run through some kind of key concepts of how we, uh, how we talk about Couchbase um, and how certain things uh, work and operate. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, for basic uh, read and write operations, we're going to take a look at what that looks like first. Um, a write operation, um, as, uh, as, as Dipti and others have explained, the application nodes themselves, uh, the application client servers themselves, uh, figure out who uh, is owning uh, a piece of data. And so every request is really just between uh, the application server and the node uh, responsible for that item. So a write uh, goes into the cache, uh, is replicated out to other nodes, uh, and is eventually persisted to disk. Um, one of the interesting things to note here is the difference in speed uh, between replication and disk persistence, and we'll talk about that a little more later. Um, when you want to update a document, it's actually exactly the same in Couchbase. We don't even have a concept of uh, update versus uh, write except what your application wants to do with the data. Everything is still a, a atomic uh, update or atomic write into the cache. So it goes in, same process, uh, sent out, replicated, uh, down to disk, and replaces the, uh, the content that was there. Um, and we've added operations that let the, the application and development team uh, control uh, or at least know when these various events have taken place. Uh, so even though the write itself is asynchronous back to the application, uh, you can then ask the cluster, hey, have you replicated this yet? Or how many times have you replicated it? Um, or hey, have you persisted this to disk yet? Um, and then you can wrap that in layers in your application that um, provide the, the notion of synchronicity or at least the notion of uh, increased reliability. Uh, a read operation is very simple. Uh, the application asks for a document and it's sent back out of cache if it's there. Um, and we're going to look at what happens if it's not there in just a moment. Um, but uh, as you start putting in more and more data, it gets written to disk, and eventually you fill up your uh, cache or you fill up your RAM, and Couchbase will automatically select uh, some data uh, not to reside in cache after it's already been written to disk. So in, in this example, uh, document one uh, is, you can see, only available on disk. When the application goes to uh, read that, uh, the same get request is made, uh, the document is read from disk, uh, and then sent directly out of cache, and stays in cache um, as long as there is space available, um, potentially pushing other data out if it hasn't been accessed in a while, um, but all of that is managed uh, dynamically. Um, we have, uh, in 2.0, we have some even more enhanced algorithms really to uh, ensure or at least uh, do our best to keep the relevant data uh, in cache that you are accessing at any one point in time. 
Um, and then, uh, so all of that was when you are requesting individual documents, individual items, um, and that's, those requests are spread over the whole cluster. Um, when it comes time to deal with the views and queries that 2.0 produces, um, and I think you already saw this, uh, a similar slide to this, um, but each node uh, processes its own index, its own view, uh, both on the active and the replica data, um, and that's for the purpose of, of failover, so we have these indexes pre-built. Um, when the application wants to ask for uh, one of these lists or one of these views, um, a request is sent to any one of the servers, um, and in fact, all of the servers can participate in a, in a load balanced fashion. Um, that request is fanned out uh, to all of the nodes participating. Uh, the response is then aggregated and sent back to the application. Um, and, and the interesting part here is that um, no matter what you're doing, whether it's individual document reads or uh, index and, and view reads, um, from the application's perspective, it looks like a single logical unit. Um, it's a single logical database that in reality is spread across many nodes underneath, uh, but you don't ever have to worry about where those are uh, or who's participating in the uh, requests. Okay, so let's take a look at what it means to size a cluster. Um, and, and this um, is really kind of one of the most important things to understand about uh, deploying Couchbase in production. Um, a, a properly sized cluster will perform the way you want it to. Uh, an undersized cluster will probably not. Um, and so there are various factors that you need to take into account um, when deciding how many nodes and how large those nodes should be. Um, you want to serve the majority of your reads out of RAM. Uh, so as we saw uh, earlier, those cache misses uh, will take longer to read from disk. Uh, and so you want to have enough RAM, not to necessarily to store the entire data set, but to store the data that you're interacting with. Uh, and we talk a lot about interactivity. So whether that's reading or writing, uh, you want to be doing that into and out of RAM. Um, and then you need enough I.O., both disk and network, uh, for, your, for your write operations um, and any disk activity that needs to go on. Um, and then you want to be aware of what uh, the potential for failure looks like. Um, and we'll look at each one of these uh, going through. Uh, the, the nice thing to realize uh, about Couchbase Server, um, every one of these factors scales out linearly. Uh, so as you are increasing your write workload, uh, that write workload is shared amongst all of the nodes of the cluster. By adding more nodes, you get more disk throughput, um, and you get more aggregate RAM um, and more network throughput. Um, so, to determine how many nodes I need for a, uh, a Couchbase deployment, there are basically five characteristics that you need to take into account. Um, and any one of these could be the determining factor. Um, and when we talk about the determining factor, one aspect, or maybe a combination, will say you need this many nodes, and that will be the highest number, and so that's how many nodes you need. Um, it's usually between RAM and disk. Um, it's usually RAM, um, but you'll see how everything uh, affects this. Um, as I mentioned before, you want to keep your working set uh, in RAM, and the next slide is going to talk more about what a working set is, um, but uh, that means you need enough RAM to, take, to, to hold uh, all of this, uh, this data. Uh, so your working set gets cached in RAM, uh, there's an amount of metadata per item uh, that needs to live in RAM, uh, your keys are held in RAM for very fast lookup, um, you want to make sure you're taking into account uh, the fact that you have active and replicate data uh, in the system, um, and it's valuable to have some of that replica data in RAM uh, in case you need to access it. Um, and then with 2.0, uh, this whole idea of indexing and querying is greatly benefited by uh, uh, disk uh, and, and uh, disk buffering, um, and so leaving some RAM uh, available. Uh, when, I, when we talk about total RAM, it's total RAM across the whole cluster. Uh, so you never have to have one node that contains the entire data set. You never have to have one node that's the bottleneck or the single point. Um, and so the entirety of the cluster participates uh, in, in aggregating all of this RAM. Um, so the, the working set uh, is very dependent on your application. Um, for, for some uh, applications, you have a relatively small working set and a large total data set. Uh, many late stage social games uh, fall into this category where they may have hundreds of millions of users that have one time logged in and participated, uh, but now they only have a few thousand daily active users. Um, and so that becomes your working set that you only need the RAM to support that for. Um, there are other applications that are, are somewhere in the middle. Um, and then there are the, the ad networks. 
um, and very high performance random access applications um, that need to have their entire data set cached in RAM uh, because they don't have a concept of a working set. Any piece of the data could be, uh, could be accessed and needs to be accessed in that very low latency, high throughput uh, nature. And so by configuring Couchbase uh, with uh, an amount of RAM, uh, you get the control over deciding how much uh, data gets cached in RAM. You give it enough to cache the whole thing, it will cache the whole thing. You give it enough to cache only 20%, it'll only leave 20% in RAM. Um, and so as, you are, as we saw earlier, as you increase uh, the amount of data you're storing in RAM, Couchbase automatically uh, ejects data um, from RAM to make space for more data. Um, uh, the active and the replica share this. Um, it's based on some thresholds uh, within the system. Um, and it's important to note that only uh, cleanly persisted data can be ejected from RAM. We're not gonna throw something out that we don't have safely on disk yet. Um, uh, and then the metadata itself cannot be ejected from RAM. Um, so you do eventually have the possibility of filling up the database. Um, and we have operations that, or, or messaging back to the application that says, hey, I'm full, uh, and you need to either give me more space or wait till I uh, can make some more space before you start putting data back in. Um, uh, there's also, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, with the 2.0 addition of indexes um, and views, uh, when you want to have very good query performance, uh, it helps to provide the system with extra uh, RAM to, uh, to cache the, the disk access. Um, and we've just begun doing some, some testing on this. But we can see that by increasing the, uh, the amount of RAM uh, left over, uh, you can really reduce the latency um, and increase the throughput of these, uh, of these view queries. Um, getting on to, to disk sizing, uh, RAM sizing is all about just space. You need enough space. We know the I.O. performance. We know the, uh, the, the latency and throughput we can get from RAM. But with disk, uh, you have to take into consideration both the amount of data you have on disk um, and also the I.O. Uh, required to, to deal with that data. Um, so there are things like your sustained write capacity, uh, the rebalance ability, um, taking backups, uh, doing cross data center replication. Uh, I'm going to talk about compaction in a minute, um, all of those things take I.O., take uh, activity to the disk. Um, and again, the more disks you have, the more I.O. throughput you have. Um, and then from a space perspective, um, uh, compaction and uh, the total amount of data that you're storing, both actual data and indexes, uh, all need to be taken into account uh, when you are sizing how much disk space I need. Uh, and again, uh, all of that scales out. So the more nodes you have, the more disk you have. You don't necessarily need to uh, have one system with just uh, a large amount of disk. Uh, the append only uh, aspect of this we're going to talk about in a couple slides, um, but is a change from 1.8 to, to 2.0, um, and so we'll look at how that uh, changes things. Um, the I.O., uh, as I mentioned, I already went through these things, um, and, and space as well. Um, we have specifically allowed for the configuration uh, of indexes and data uh, to be on different paths or different partitions. Um, and so you can use, uh, in Amazon, you would use different EBS devices. Uh, in, your hard, in your data center, you would use potentially different physical drives or, or SSDs um, to parallelize that even within a single node. Um, and we're starting to do some testing as well to see how that, uh, that enhances the performance um, of, of disk I.O. Um, views uh, have, have their own uh, additions and characteristics of the effect on um, I.O. and space. So uh, the more design documents you have, the more space is going to be taken up. Um, but you can segregate your views uh, by design document so that um, uh, you control what views are accessed and what views are updated at different points um, in time. Uh, the more complex your views are, the more I.O. Uh, they have in order to process that data. Um, and then the amount of data you're, you're outputting in that index. Um, with relational databases, you just have an index. Uh, but if you've seen any of the, the presentations, uh, you get much more control over uh, what your index looks like. And so if you output a whole bunch of data, it's going to have to reside somewhere. Um, and that's going to take up more disk space. Um, keep in mind, that the uh, one nuance to that, the document IDs uh, are always included in the view output, so you don't need to output them again. 
Um, we have this notion of development views uh, that allow you to operate on a production work set, production, sorry, production data set um, without impacting the whole cluster. Uh, and so you can use that to uh, build up a small index and then extrapolate that over however large your entire data set would be in order to prepare for uh, the, the required size um, uh, of those. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, append-only uh, file formats. This is a, a change from, from 1.8. We were using uh, SQLite, which is a, uh, a, a um, write in place where you open up a file and you change some bits inside of it. So when you add new data, you're just overwriting data that existed there. Um, with the uh, new uh, persistence layer based off of CouchDB, uh, we're not doing that. We're using something called append only. And I'll show you an example of, of what it actually looks like. Uh, but it provides us much better performance, much better consistent performance, um, and is also much more reliable because you're never actually changing anything that you already have written. Um, it also completely removes any idea of, of fragmentation, uh, which was a, a reasonably uh, large thorn in our side uh, with SQLite. Uh, over time, the database would get more and more fragmented. It would slow down um, and it would affect performance. Um, we don't have that anymore with 2.0, which is great. Um, but it does lead to uh, a, an ever-growing disk size uh, if you don't have the ability to remove uh, that invalidated data. Um, and so that's what compaction is all about. So uh, as you're writing to disk, uh, you write record A uh, and it goes on to a disk file. You write record B and it goes on to a disk file. You write record C and it goes on to a disk file. Um, you need to have all three of these records in your disk so they take up that space. As you start updating data, uh, if we change document A, uh, the old one is still there on disk. The new one is just popped on the end. Uh, we do the same to B. If we insert a new document, D goes in there. Um, and then A could get changed again. Um, and so you have this at least three records um, that are not valid. They're not used, um, but they're, they're taking up space on disk. With our compaction process, uh, it basically takes the valid data, rewrites it into a new file, um, and removes the old one. So you've now shrunk that uh, by those three records, um, and, and in practice by you know, potentially millions of records, um, uh, and, and maintained and saved your disk space. All of this happens automatically. Uh, while the system is under load, um, we have settings that control both the amount of uh, fragmented data um, or, or amount of invalidated data um, and the setting for the, the time of day to either uh, allow compaction to happen or not allow. Um, it will take up uh, some more I.O. Uh, it will use some, some CPU in order to do it. So we wanted to provide the controls for various applications uh, to control when that happens. Um, but but uh, by design, really shouldn't have an impact on the application's overall performance, um, unless you're, you're you know, doing a lot of reading from disk or you have other um, considerations to take into place. Uh, the configuration is per bucket uh, or cluster-wide. Um, OK, um, I'm going through this really quickly because I have a lot of material, um, and I want to have time at the end for questions. So um, I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm rushing a bit, but I do want to get all the way to the end. Um, CPU uh, was actually not a part of the last time I did this presentation um, because it really didn't matter with 1.8. Uh, with 1.8, you could have 99%, 100% CPU and really not see any difference in performance because of our serving that data from RAM. Um, with 2.0, that's still the case for RAM uh, data, um, but now you need CPU in order to perform uh, the indexing, uh, cross data center replication, um, the compaction of data on disk. Um, and so it becomes one of those things that you now need to start thinking about, making sure that you have enough CPU. And we're not talking about 64-way servers here. We're talking about like an 8-core instead of a 4-core, um, or a 4-core instead of a 1-core. Um, and again, scaling that out allows all of the nodes to process each their own uh, individual data set, their own workload. Um, and again, you don't need to consolidate that all into a single um, uh, or you know, a small cluster. Um, network, I touch very briefly on because it's usually not a problem at all, but it's some, one of those things that every, every good uh, ad administrator should be thinking about. Uh, you're putting data on the network. It's getting replicated. You're potentially pulling it out of the network. You want to make sure you have enough bandwidth. 
Um, this is more one of those things you don't really size for, but if you start to see some performance problems that aren't explained by anything else, you look at network bandwidth, you look at uh, packets per second. Um, Amazon has very different network characteristics than a, uh, a 10 gigabit uh, data center um, network. Um, so those are the kind of things that you want to just keep in mind um, where it's usually not something that you have to plan for uh, up front. Um, and, and to that end, uh, one of the, the recent benchmarks that we published uh, with uh, Cisco and a, a company called SolarFlare uh, that makes a 10 gigabit uh, network interface card. Um, and Couchbase was able to provide uh, that, that bottom line down there. Uh, the bottom blue line is sub-100 microsecond uh, response times uh, up to, I think, 16K uh, object sizes. Um, and even though that purple one looks like it's supposed to be the bad one, um, that's a single gigabit network still under 500 micro millise uh, microseconds. Um, so this whole graph is under one millisecond um, from, from you know, a, a 1K object up to a 16K object. Um, the, the bottom line is, is optimized networking. Um, the servers themselves were nothing, were nothing special, um, but the, the point here is really that Couchbase, the software, um, is capable of providing extremely low latencies, um, and, and with low latency comes very high throughput, given whatever network it's in. Um, so we can't make Amazon's network faster, um, but we're not the bottleneck there. Um, lastly, uh, this idea of data distribution um, in any sort of large environment is usually not a problem, but customers very frequently say, oh, I'm just going to go into production with one node. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd really prefer you not do that. Um, one node is a single point of failure. Uh, two nodes, okay, you have replication, but one goes down and now you have a single point of failure. Um, and also when it does come time to add more nodes, uh, starting with three allows all three nodes to, to participate uh, in moving data to a fourth or, or a fifth or a tenth. Um, and, and three nodes give you both uh, replication and uh, I.O. distribution and all of the good things that we're talking about. So don't go into production with one node, please, ever, anywhere. Um, so just to recap on that, um, again, sizing is one of those things that is an art in and of itself, and there are so many different characteristics to take into consideration. Um, there's no way I can cover them all uh, within this uh, presentation, but these are the kind of things you have to keep in mind. And each application is going to have slightly different characteristics when it comes to uh, each one of these. Um, and so uh, very heavy write workloads will, be, will need more disk throughput. Uh, so you may have more nodes just for that. Um, very read intensive or, or random workloads uh, will need lots of RAM. Um, and so you may have more nodes because of that. Um, and so those are the kind of things that, uh, that determine how many nodes and, and how large those nodes are. Um, the next equally most important thing, um, if we can have two 100% important things, um, is, is monitoring. Um, and this is one of the areas that Couchbase really shines um, in terms of uh, its ability to provide insight into the cluster. Um, again, those key resources, those key things that determined your sizing, so those are the things you're going to want to monitor. You're going to want to monitor those so you know if you need to increase your scale uh, or increase your size. Um, so again, RAM, disk, uh, network, and CPU. Um, we provide, um, this is actually just a recap of monitor these things. Um, so uh, we provide an immense amount of data, um, both visually um, and even underlying in, in the system. So our REST API has, uh, I don't know, at last count, some 100 different statistics that are gathered uh, across all of the nodes, aggregated, uh, tracked historically, um, and, and designed to give the administrator uh, a very uh, in-depth view into what, uh, their, how their cluster is performing. Um, below that, there are hundreds, 300, 400 more statistics that are more debugging, more diagnostic uh, type things that you wouldn't monitor on a regular basis, um, but can provide very, very deep insight into what uh, a node is doing, uh, what a cluster is doing um, from uh, ev every aspect of every thread, of every disk write queue, uh, of every operation and how long it took to serve uh, out of RAM, how long each disk fetch took. Uh, we have these nice histograms built up um, 
So Couchbase really prides itself on and, and I think really shines um, in terms of being able to answer those questions about what's going on and is it going to be a problem or it's a problem right now, what do I do about it? Um, and the kind of questions that you can't ask from uh, very black box systems. Um, so some of the key uh, things that you want to monitor outside of just those, uh, those sizing parameters um, or, or in conjunction with them, um, if your working set is in or out of RAM, um, looking at the cache miss rate, how many requests are coming from disk uh, that should be served or could be served from RAM. Um, if your disk I.O. is not sufficient, you'll see that you're not able to write data down to disk quickly enough. Um, if you, all of your writes are getting down to disk in a reasonable fashion, you have enough disk I.O. to handle your cluster handle your workload. <clears throat> Um, if you're concerned about network um, and looking at the internal uh, replication lag, uh, we have those queues monitored, um, and so you would see one node start to back up uh, and be able to do something about it. The whole point of monitoring uh, is not to find out after the fact. The whole point of monitoring is to be able to proactively do something, proactively take action um, to relieve whatever pain point is about to send you off a cliff. Um, so this is uh, not 2.0, this is, this is 1.8, but this is from a live um, production environment, uh, one of our uh, larger social game customers. Um, and I like to show this slide um, because it really shows uh, what many of us know uh, already about our application uh, is that there is an oscillation of, of workload. Uh, there are peaks and valleys. Um, some of us know our, we don't have any peaks and valleys, but most of us have some sort of a, uh, a life cycle or, or a daily cycle. Um, and over a week's time, it produces this very, uh, very regular graph with, uh, you know, Friday night being uh, at, the, at the top there. Um, but this is showing that throughout this entire workload, Couchbase is providing the same performance to the application, uh, even as they are, are writing, um, you know, in the orders of tens to hundreds of thousands of operations per second difference between their, uh, their peaks and their, uh, and their valleys. Um, and also the idea of how your working set is going to change over time. Um, and, and Couchbase automatically uh, migrating data from RAM, into di from RAM down to disk and, uh, and back again to, to ensure that uh, that performance is, is kept up. Um, so this is like the top section of our, of our UI, um, and then there's, there's a 50 or so statistics below that, um, and then you can ask uh, for this data and much more uh, about each node uh, in the cluster. Um, okay, uh, lastly, uh, we'll go through some of the um, management tasks um, uh, associated with, with running Couchbase in production, um, scaling, um, the idea of either upgrading or scheduled maintenance, uh, backup and restore, um, and, and dealing with the inevitable uh, failures. Um, these are all the sort of things that every database should provide. Um, unfortunately, not, not all of them do. Um, and, and these are the kind of things that you should be prepared to uh, do uh, as you're administrating Couchbase, as you're running it um, in production. Um, so uh, as you need to scale, as you need to uh, add more nodes, um, if you need more RAM, you can add another node and get the aggregate uh, amount. If you need more disk I.O. or more disk space, uh, again, adding nodes. I think we see a, a repeating trend here. Um, you can also do things like swapping uh, smaller nodes for larger ones, um, and so scaling up your entire cluster. Um, so allowing you very flexibly under load um, to, uh, to change the topology, change the configuration, change the, the hardware if you need to do a, a hardware refresh or an OS upgrade. Um, that's going to be covered in one of the next slides. Um, but this idea of um, scaling linearly um, was part of that, that Cisco benchmark, too. So initially, we looked at uh, the latency uh, being very, very uh, low and flat. Um, and, and this is looking at, at throughput uh, going from one node handling 260,000 operations per second. Uh, and we added a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth. Um, and the line is 
you know, nearly, nearly perfectly linear, um, getting all the way up to, to well over a million and a half operations per second on uh, five nodes. Um, and that's the idea uh, that, that it's, it's hard to show RAM scaling out. It's hard to show disk scaling out because it just adds up. But by doing that, uh, you allow the cluster to continue handling more and more data, uh, handling more and more load. Uh, just some of the details from that benchmark. Um, it was on 1.8, but 2.0 has the same characteristics. Um, similar to uh, Renat's uh, Alturus's test, uh, one server uh, or one client server. Um, the, the server below, uh, the last bullet point here is the, uh, there's a lot of details there, but if you look through each one of them, it's basically an off the shelf uh, pizza box server that, that Cisco provided um, with you know, a reasonable CPU, but nothing very special, um, a good amount of RAM, um, and this was all about, this was all about the network. This was all about showing that couch-based software uh, in, a, in a network um, can provide um, that kind of performance. Um, so uh, upgrades, uh, whether it be from a minor version or to a major version, uh, are very well supported and, and easy to perform. Um, so you add a new node, add a node of a new version, uh, remove a node of the old one. You can do that at the same time, so it's just one swap operation, um, and continue that uh, for as many nodes in your cluster, uh, all without taking the application down, all without changing the, the performance. Um, you use that for, as I mentioned, upgrades, hardware refreshes, uh, planned maintenance, um, and we will allow you to go from uh, 1.8 to, to 2.0. Um, even though there's, there's drastically different features, we've, we've done the testing and are uh, allowing you to, uh, to add 2.0 nodes to a, to a 1.8 cluster. Once you move them all over to 2.0, you'll get the, the new functionality that it, that it provides. We need to have some sort of uh, homogeneous uh, cluster to, to actually use the, the views and such. Um, <clears throat> the same following along that, um, if a node is not performing well um, but is still uh, alive and still available, um, you can remove it um, but while ensuring that the data stays replicated, um, protecting the data distribution and, and, and safety. Um, again, if you're monitoring and you see that the node is starting to have problems or maybe the disk is filling up, um, you can remove it before it becomes a problem. Um, and we, we always best practice say uh, you want to swap it with uh, an equally sized node so that you maintain the overall capacity of your cluster. Um, backups uh, are extremely easy to perform. We provide a tool uh, that reads the data uh, either from RAM or from disk, um, depending on the, the different desired characteristics there, and creates uh, a set of backup files. Um, it's important to realize that this is not a snapshot. This is not a consistent point in time backup. Uh, those are very hard, if not impossible, to achieve on a distributed system uh, that's under load. Um, so if for some reason you needed uh, a perfectly consistent consistent cross-cluster backup, uh, you're going to have to stop writing to the cluster, um, which is usually not an option for, for any of our customers. So we focus on a backup being valid. We focus on a backup allowing you to have the data um, and, and relaxing some of those consistency um, restraints that, that make it, that, that would prevent us from doing that at all. Um, a restore uh, is just going the opposite process, uh, taking what's stored in the database files uh, and distributing it into a new cluster uh, or back into the same cluster or into a new bucket, whatever, wherever you want it to go, it doesn't matter. The, the restore is just sending the data into the, the RAM interface where it then uh, interacts with the cluster, flows through, um, and acts like any application workload. So very easy and, and simple to do, um, and we provide the, the tools necessary to do it. Um, so, uh, finally, um, failures do, do happen. Hardware fails, network fails, um, software, you know, occasionally has a problem or two. Um, and so, uh, our primary goal, or I'm sorry, our primary uh, resilience against failure is off-node replication. Uh, so as soon as you make a change to data, we try to get it off that node as quickly as possible. Uh, maybe we get it to two or three nodes even if you really want to be safe. Um, and then when a failure happens, it's just a matter of activating that replica data. Um, so I'm going to come back to this slide, but I want to show what that looks like. Um, so if we're accessing server number three, uh, you're actually accessing all the nodes, but let's just focus on three. When it fails, there have to be some requests that fail. You've already put them on the wire uh, before you knew it failed. So you, your application has to be prepared for some sort of timeout or some sort of error uh, to happen. If the network cable was severed, you have to be prepared for that. So it's not a matter of uh, constant 
always availability from your application uh, because there are so many things that can go wrong. You just have to be prepared for some failures to happen. Once the node is detected is down, those replicas become active, the application is updated, and all the access continues. This failover process can be either automatic, done within the cluster itself, um, or, uh, or manual, done by clicking a button uh, or triggering it from an external script. Um, and, and I could ask 100 people in the room and get a 200 answers about why they would want it to be automatic or manual. It's an it's a administrator and applications decision. Um, you'll notice, though, that the data becomes available, um, but it's not replicated. We don't want to create more load on the cluster that's already failed. Uh, so we don't recreate that data. We don't recreate the replicas, um, which would put increased load on the RAM, increased load on the disk, potentially lead to another failure that would be just uh, even further catastrophic. And so as an operational database, we give the administrator the control to return that node to service, maybe add another one, maybe increase the cluster by five nodes because he was undersized and that led to the failure, um, and then perform the rebalance uh, that lays out the data again, uh, redistributes it, recreates the replicas, um, and, and allows you to, when you're ready, uh, return the cluster to, to full capacity. So at, at 2 a.m., the node goes down, the automatic failover kicks in, the application continues, nobody knows the difference. You come in at 7 a.m. Or, or 8 a.m. or in California, you come in at 10 a.m. Um, and decide, okay, now I'm gonna reboot this node and now I'm gonna rebalance it and, and we'll bring everything back to normal. Um, so, uh, to wrap up, uh, this is what we looked at today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the, the presentation. I apologize for talking uh, a little extra fast. Um, there are a lot of details that I had to gloss over quickly. Um, we've done our best to document uh, with instructions and examples and best practices and formulas and calculations and all that other stuff. So uh, please uh, go and visit um, our, our documentation. Um, and keep in mind that this is also a work in progress. We're always adding new things based upon your feedback. Questions that we get get into the documentation. Um, new things that we discover get into the documentation. So um, that, that that can be and should be probably your first place for asking a question. If you don't find the answer, email me and tell me so I can get it, I can get it in there. Thank you all very much. Um, and I can now take some questions and maybe provide some answers. Yes, sir. So to, uh, the question was, are the backup and restore, or just the backup tools, uh, incremental or a complete backup? Um, today, they are complete backups. Uh, we have some of the functionality in there to make it incremental. Uh, we just need to, to put the finishing touches on it and, and, and productize it. Um, so we've thought about that, and it's obviously something that's needed. Um, right now, it's a, it's a full backup. Right, Steve? OK, thank you. Uh, yes? Right, so the, the question was if the backup is, is inconsistent or, or best effort backup, you know, on restore, do you overwrite the, the data that may have been newer or, or older? Um, and the restore tool actually gives you the ability to control um, not necessarily the time of overwrite, but whether I want to overwrite at all. Um, and so you use a flag that says only put in data that's not there already. Um, and so you can use that to, to merge data sets without overwriting something that you already had in there. Um, or you can just say overwrite everything. Um, and that's using those memcached operations of, of set versus add. Um, other questions? The side of the room. Yes. When I talk about how Couchbase functions, I talk about the design of the architecture. I talk about how ideally everything works together um, uh, because I believe that we've architected it in a way that um, should and will be the most effective, and this is how uh, the design of it is, uh, is working. Anything that doesn't match this behavior or doesn't perform the way we believe it should is a bug that needs to and will be fixed. Um, and so we've had many optimizations to the, the rebalance code over the last uh, two and a half years. Um, 2.0 extends that uh, constantly. Every, uh, you know, every new release is going to have some new uh, optimization, some expansion of the, uh, the use case and the data sets that we can, uh, that we can handle. So uh, maybe afterwards I'll, I'll talk about some of the specific things that we've done in 1.8.1 and uh, 2.0, which are, are going to address a lot of that. Um, but keep in mind that this is, this is software, and we are a software company that's constantly looking at uh, handling and better handling the, the demands that are put on us. 
So vacuuming, a uh, question was about, uh, about vacuuming. Vacuuming is a SQLite problem that we don't have anymore. Um, vacuuming was the idea that um, as SQLite, as you put more and more write and delete workload in it, uh, it gets fragmented and it slows down. Um, the only way to really resolve that was uh, to, to clean up the database, uh, the, the underlying disk storage. Unfortunately, that wasn't something we were ever able to do online, um, and so you, you had to take it down and do that, which is usually not an option for, for just about anybody. Uh, we came up with some ways to use our rebalancing to kind of cycle nodes um, and automatically rewrite the data, which, which helped a lot, but is, is an administrative process we don't want to deal with. Um, 2.0, as I showed with compaction, um, is the equivalent of vacuuming, but that happens online um, and, and automatically, and you don't have the same performance problems before that's taken place. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I'm out of time. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, thank you again for coming.